the online participants. Uh, what we're going to do is talk about a book that Chatham House and Brookings Institution just published. I'm um, here with three of the authors uh, and another author is online. And this is the book, although printing it has been more of a challenge uh, than I expected. It, it is actually going to arrive to all of you. I'm sorry about this. Um, they um, have been doing book launches without books. It seems like I feel like I'm just playing, making play uh, time here. The, um, the idea of the book originally was to look, take a look at sort of the novel uh, challenges uh, in contemporary world order to human rights. Um, sort of based on the observations that, first of all, you know, the rise of populism is challenging human rights norms and institutions in, in new ways. You know, the issue of Hungary, Poland, for example, in the EU, and the European Commission, uh, and the ways in which they're struggling to sort of, if you will, sort of sanction one of their own members um, that has many of the facade, much of the facade of democracy. Uh, but at the same time, you have you know, the, the oddity of, of um, President Maduro in Venezuela, President uh, Nicolas Ortega and um, uh, Daniel Ortega rather in uh, um, Nicaragua and Donald Trump all just uh, uh, refusing to cooperate with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights um, and just trying to undermine sort of the uh, international infrastructure, uh, regional infrastructure of human rights in that case. Added to that, we talk about in the book is um, in the case of the inter-American system of human rights, and, and Angelica will talk about it, um, you have the issue that evangelicals cut the budget of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights on the no pun intended trumped up charges uh, that it was promoting uh, abortion rights. Uh, so you have these multiple challenges at the same time as Alex will talk, we have the challenges of a, of a much more active Russia and China that are um, trying to recreate or even hack uh, create parallel institutions, counter norms, if you will, that further their own particular uh, national interests um, in the international system, as well as the challenges of the uh, of technology. And Thompson Chingeta, who I'll introduce in a second, is talking about the rise of autonomous weapon systems and AI and its effects and the lack of accountability and those challenges and how, in many cases, multilateral institutions simply aren't fit for purpose to be able to manage and oversee those. Um, and then the issue of the internet uh, and the rise of China's efforts to recreate and its own pro protocols and the lack of access or attention by human rights groups on, on efforts with, of what China is doing uh, to uh, reestablish its own um, its own sort of internet protocols that replicate what it's doing domestically. And then we look at the regional institution, regional situation of human rights. We look at the African system of human rights, the European system of human rights. Uh, the Latin American system of human rights, the inter-American system. And while it doesn't have a system of human rights, also it talks about the Middle East uh, and the impact of geopolitical competition, uh, and especially post um, the, the, um, the, the Arab Spring and challenges to human rights there. And, and also talks about the, um, the issue of um, pull out of Afghanistan, what that said, what signal that sent to human rights activists uh, within the Middle East and US and Western commitment to human rights. Um, what we'll do is I'm going to have uh, the authors speak uh, in this order. Alex probably doesn't need any introduction. Are you still the director of the Herman Institute? Okay, Alex is a professor of Just a citizen. Just a citizen, a, uh, like all of us. Um, the, uh, and then we'll, Thompson Chengeda, who's an uh, associate professor um, in Liverpool. Uh, and then we'll have uh, Angelica, who is at the Robert F. Kennedy Memorial, uh, will talk, and then Asla. Bari, who's a, a, you know, professor at Yale Law School, right? You changed from, yeah. so in the course of this was a two-year project, <laughs> things happened, COVID <laughs> happened. Um, you got a new job, moved to the East Coast from uh, Los Angeles. Um, Thompson got a new job. So it's been, a, it's been a long, and any book, anyone who's ever written a book uh, knows it's a long process uh, getting there. It's been funny. It's been a very compressed and unique, let's say, two years in this process. So. Um, I will say, just um, ending on this, the last chapter does try to provide recommendations for policymakers to address a number of these issues, um, and also recommendations for future research. The, the, if you will, the, the conceit of this book is that we're identifying new challenges, uh, challenges that really aren't being considered, in some cases not even individually, but certainly in their collective, on um, the international human rights system and its norms. Uh, and so with that, we also try to propose recommendations for policymakers, for human rights activists, as well as for academics and scholars. So, Alex, okay. take it away. Thanks so much, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here with 
fellow authors and panelists. And so I'm looking forward to their insights. And um, thank you for joining us uh, both in person and, and online. So my, my contribution um, had to do with China and Russia, but it also had to do with thinking about how the global governance architecture that was uh, once assumed, perhaps naively, um, to support uh, human rights norms and human rights um, monitoring um, has slowly been repurposed over the last 20 years um, in a way that perhaps goes against um, the spirit, um, but also uh, some of the liberal values uh, originally envisioned uh, that this architect in this architecture, this architecture would embody. And I want to sort of focus on three dimensions here. One is some of the central pillars, uh, international organizations and that we've seen repurposed and that have tilted towards both China and Russia and Chinese and Russian led norms and counter norms about um, what constitutes um, um, uh, a legitimate uh, human rights inquiry. Uh, second, I want to uh, uh, discuss the rise of new regional institutions that now exist in parallel to regional institutions, how they're challenging some of the assumptions we had uh, about the role of regional organizations in promoting human rights. And third, I want to discuss uh, this business of gongos versus NGOs and how they fit into this emerging sort of global governance picture. So it's a it's kind of a very macro 30,000 foot in the air viewpoint. Um, but but still, I think it, it sets the stage for some of these uh, broader trends. So um, international organizations, I think increasingly we've seen um, that uh, uh, both the rise of China and Russia, plus um, the lack of U.S. commitment, and in some cases, um, very open retrenchment um, from membership in some of these international organizations and bodies, um, has shifted some of their focus and some of the outcomes. Uh, in the book, I talk about um, sort of the, uh, the lessons of the vote, uh, the original vote in 2019 um, to criticize China over Xinjiang. Council, where uh, initially we had 22 members uh, that came out, um, you know, critical of the re-education camps, and you know these were like mapped perfectly onto kind of like the, the core of the liberal international orders, um, or uh, as 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 it likes to sort of self-identify anyway. Um, and it was you know Scandinavian countries, Western Europe, New Zealand, um, Australia, Japan. Uh, and so forth. And then a few weeks later, uh, China uh, issues a counter letter um, that's comprised of actually 37 members and then expands to over 50 members um, that not only uh, sort of uh, you know, defends the situation, China's practices uh, in Xinjiang, but also says that China is, embodies, and upholds um, um, the UN uh, human rights commitments. Right. Um, and then, you know, that map, we had a visual, would look very different, right? We'd see countries from uh, Latin America, uh, Africa, uh, the Middle East, and the Gulf um, um, on there, um, as well as Serbia would sign that also. Later. So, so we've seen a replay of that just recently um, when the council had a very high profile uh, diplomatic vote. Um, to sort of question whether they should open an investigation uh, into the camps. And there we saw extensive lobbying um, by both um, China uh, and, um, and the United States on, 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 on trying to get votes around. And China won, in essence, right? Um, I think the vote was 18 to 16. Ukraine changed its mind. Originally, it had sort of abstained. Um, but, but, but in any case, um, um, the, the investigation will will not proceed. There were uh, a ton of abstentions, including um, liberal democracies, um, like Mexico, I think, abstained. Uh, Brazil was one of the abstainers, uh, and so forth. And so it, um, China responds that, you know, it would have been very unusual to have one of the permanent members investigated for its human rights practices. Um, but nevertheless, I think it shows, uh, um, you know, trends in this body. The other organization I point to is the OSCE, that is very active in the post-communist part of the world. OSCE has been founded or was founded in the 1990s on three pillars 
security dimension, economic dimension, human dimension. The human dimension is, for all practical purposes, um, frozen. It doesn't do it. Um, we have contested um, election monitoring. We have contested programs on um, uh, freedom of the media, on um, uh, minority rights, um, um, all throughout. And, and again, you know, big driving force on this has been in Russia sort of, you know, lobbying, but also threatening to withhold funding for the organization. And it's, it's not that much. So we see this repurposing, this transformation of the bias. Same time, we see the rise of new regional organizations, right? And I think in my field, international relations, there was an assumption by scholars that regionalism would help promote um, um, liberal norms and uh, uh, and the human rights system. And in part, I think, because there was an assumption that if you have regional organizations, you have a type of supranationalism, you have countries willing to give up some sovereignty and subject themselves to some regional rules and monitoring and so forth. And we've seen some really interesting trends um, sort of the other way. So take the rise of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, um, a group founded by China, uh, joined by China, Russia, um, four out of the five Central Asian countries, and most recently um, also India and Pakistan. Um, so uh, this particular group has adopted a kind of Chinese definition of security, uh, that its security mission is to combat the three evils, separatism, extremism, and terrorism. Uh, and within this, uh, they keep an integrated list of uh, these three evils, both at the individual level and at the organizational. Um, and so this list, when it first came out, included about 15 organizations, a few dozen individuals, and now it's exploded to over, by own public uh, releases, over 50 organizations and thousands of individuals. As best as we can tell, this has become a forum of sort of uh, uh, log rolling. In other words, uh, each country designates their particular uh, separatists, extremists, and terrorists are just political dissidents, and there's mutual recognition of them. So the list grows, grows, and grows. There's no mechanism for delisting. There's no transparency for you know why you're included or what the procedure is uh, for going there. And practically, there's a real price to pay here because um, the, the SCO security treaty allows one member country to extradite those accused to another member country bypassing um, a political or legal asylum process, right? The, 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 the standard, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but the standard I think is accusatory. It's not even you know, this actual evidence. It also allows for fellow member countries for 30 days to extraterritorially conduct investigations on each other's territories too. And that's been just um, used by Russia and China to justify security services activities in these countries. We've also seen some Central Asian countries hand over uh, suspected protesters to each other, invoking regional security treaties. The SEO not by name, but it might have been the CIS. Um, the other aspect of this, I'll, I'll point to the Interparliamentary Council of the group of Commonwealth of Independent States. Um, Ed Lemon has done some really interesting research using plagiarism software, where he shows how a lot of the smaller countries, Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, have adopted wholesale Russian definitions of extremism and protest. Um, just, you know, 75, 80 percent correspondence. And these are uh, disseminated through these interparliamentary assembly types of committees. So again, this regional dissemination of, of norms. Um, and then finally, I'll just point to the rise of gongos. We all have our favorite gongos and gongo stories. Um, here, I'll just make the following analytical point that it's not so much um, that we don't know that gongos are associated with particular government, thereby I mean government organized or sponsored non governmental organizations. It's not that we don't know that they're not affiliated with governments or supported by governments, you know, youth groups, um, some citizens' rights groups, um, and so forth. It's that they're increasingly inserting themselves into civil society organizations. And by doing that, actually, um, now Chris Walker, but then that uses the, the, the phrase mudding the water. I would say also just taking the space um, of conferences like the Warsaw OSCE conference, right? Where we see, you know, um, um, 
you know, most of the, you know, the first 10 speakers are gongos, right? So they're signing up. In other words, um, you know, there's a sense that a lot of these civil transnational civil society on civil society types of contact groups now aren't functioning the way they used to um, because of the insertion of these governmental sponsored and interested organizations. So what does all this mean? It just means that to me anyway, the geopolitics means that there's a lot more contestation, not only of sort of human rights, but where human rights are adjudicated, right? And how the system is supposed to sort of, you know, uh, uh, work its way through from the grassroots civil society level to the regional level, the sort of, you know, the upper, um, um, uh, you know, UN level types of human rights uh, uh, organs. And I think, um, Russia, but increasingly China too, have been you know quite effective. Uh, a lot of this is uh, a set of also of own goals, right? It's it's true that you know the U.S. and its Western allies have been very hypocritical in the practice of human rights. Um, they've been very selective. Uh, they have um, you know uh, uh, practiced one set of values in certain when dealing with certain countries um, and all that, and that's become part of the critique, part of the meme. But I think the lesson here is that if you don't engage continuously with these organs, they will be transformed, right? Um, they will be sort of taken over. And so I think, especially the damage done from withdrawing from the Human Rights Council, then just sort of <laughs> expecting that somehow you'll have influence the minute you snap your fingers and want to rejoin, I you know that's, that's deeply uh, problematic. One policy recommendation I would have and that I talk about in the book is to sort of do the opposite of uh, what the Obama administration was trying to do with some of these organizations. Um, when uh, they were particularly interested in the capacity of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, um, what they wanted to do was engage with the SCO on a kind of a limited agenda. Uh, at the time, it was questions in Afghanistan. And they say, like, let's see practically what the SEO can do, and maybe we can find some areas of cooperation. Strikes me that if you um, think of global governance as an ecosystem, this is probably not the right way of going about it. In other words, if you're going to engage, I think you need to engage all the way down and say, yeah, we'll talk about Afghanistan, but we also want to talk about the way that you list and you, you know, delist. We want to talk about what benchmarks you're using um, to sort of label these groups extremists and so forth. So. Um, you know, these groups and these organizations are here to stay, right? They're part of global governance fabric, they're part of um, the global ecology. And I think it would just be better to have comprehensive engagement along all the dimensions, both practical and normative, uh, than to just, you know, allow them um, to sort of, you know, uh, you know, increase their activities without sort of open challenging uh, about the kinds of benchmarks and standards that they're using. Thanks. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thompson. Uh, thank Another you. Issue now. Thank, you. Weapon system. thank you very much, Chris, and uh, thank you everyone uh, for the opportunity for me to perhaps just briefly today discuss some of the issues that arise from uh, the chapter titled um, Autonomous Weapon Systems, Accountability Gaps, and Racial Oppression. What I'll try to do is perhaps focus on two main, main points, if I, if I may. The, the one, first one would be to try and give some sort of a background where I look at the major challenges that are posed by autonomous weapon systems before going to the second point of zeroing in on this issue of accountability gaps and how it's linked to this aspect which I call racial oppression in the chapter. Be, before I do that, ladies and gentlemen, I, I would, I would I'd want perhaps to start by some sort of a definition in case some of you may not have come across uh, this term autonomous weapon system. What exactly are we uh, talking about? Uh, autonomous weapon system, so to say, uh, you know, the, the, the definition that is often used are uh, robotic weapons that are powered by artificial intelligence that once you activate them, they are able to make the decision as to who to target, who to kill, or who to harm without any further human control or intervention. In other words, you are talking uh, about something which are uh, called terminators or referred to them as, as killer robots, uh, et cetera. Now, this whole issue of autonomous weapon systems in terms of the discussions that have been going on, I would say you can trace it back to 2013, at least within the United Nations. 
Uh, and I always tell Chris that uh, at least I was in a way privileged to be part of the researchers who uh, researched and drafted the first UN report to the UN Human Rights Council, highlighting the challenges that are posed of football, uh, by autonomous support systems. This takes me to my first point, which I want to just briefly discuss. So what, what are those major challenges that are posed by these robotic weapons, which have got such capabilities? Now, uh, I just want to divide them perhaps into two. The first one being the uh, legal, legal, legal challenges. Myself coming from a legal background, perhaps uh, it may be fitting to start with those. Now, whenever forces you, particularly by the state, be it by, by, by state agents in, in the context of law enforcement, uh, or by it, uh, be it in terms of war and armed conflict, there are two main regimes of law or public international law that are relevant. When it's police officers who are using uh, force, particularly we are under the, the, the regime of international human rights law, uh, which is human rights are uh, the, main, the main theme in this particular group, uh, talk. Now, norms that are found under international human rights law, under human rights to begin with, there are certain norms that had the assumption that a human being would be the one who makes decisions as far as use of force. Like, for example, when you talk of the obligation under international law to protect, respect, and fulfill human rights, it has got an underlying assumption that whosoever is using force is a human being. If you go in every particular region, be to the Inter-American Court of uh, Human Rights to the Open Court of Human Rights, there is jurisprudence or there is uh, volumes and volumes of sources which explain how, for example, when we are using force, police officers need to act. For example, when it is right to life, you would say there's what we call the protect life principle. You say police officers are only allowed to use force, number one, as a last resort, Number two, when they're trying to protect another life. And number three, when there's no other moment of deliberation, in other words, there's no other choice but at that moment to use force. What do those kind of things require? People emphasize that they require situational awareness, human judgment. Can machines have that situational awareness? Can they have that uh, you know, human judgment to have no human rights? The answer that is given by many people is no. That's one of the most legal challenges. These human rights to say, if you use this kind of technologies like autonomous weapons systems, what you may end up having is a, is, is a, is a oh, violation of various kinds of human rights. Now, in terms of armed conflict, if they were to be using armed conflict, the legal challenge there, which people refer to, is the aspect where someone says, well, international humanitarian law, the law of armed conflict, has good rules such as uh, the rule of uh, distinction, that you can only target soldiers, not civilians. Rule of proportionality, that even if it's militarily necessary, your military goal should be proportional to what you're actually achieving in, in that particular circumstance. Again, the issue of value judgment comes where people say, well, machines won't be able to do that. Now, pushing aside now this aspect of uh, uh, legal, legal questions, so to say, or legal challenges, there is also one another fundamental challenge, which is of uh, uh, or ethical challenges, where people say to begin with, let's even assume that machines would be able to comply with with the law. In other words, they'll be able to comply with the law to use force in this regard. Should they do it? Should we allow machines to be able to make decisions that are far-reaching, like that one? in terms of use of force. And here I can maybe refer to Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General, who has categorically, for example, say that machines that have the power to decide who lives or dies are morally repugnant, they're politically unacceptable, and that they should be banned by international law. Of course, you'll find many ethicists or many uh, philosophers have been writing about this particular to say, when it comes to ethics, perhaps, Having machines which do not have, you know, the the, the reasoning uh, aspect, you know, which humans have to be able to make this decision is something that is unacceptable. In Africa, where I come from, I'm originally from Zimbabwe. We we do have uh, a term which is called Ubuntu, the spirit of Ubuntu, which we say 
I am because we are, we are because I am. In other words, how you want to be treated, that's how you should also treat others. And people will say, is their question, the African states, when they were making their submissions to the UN, they've been trying to say, if we're allowing machines to make decisions as to who lives and dies, are we abridging or are we, in other words, uh, acting inconsistent with that mood or dignity kind of uh, uh, aspect? Now, I come to the second point, which deals with the issue of accountability and now how I link it to the aspect of pressure or pressure. One of the fundamental challenges that are raised by autonomous open systems is to say that if they violate international human rights law, if they violate international humanitarian law, which means there are all crimes that have been committed, there are human rights violations that have been committed, who is accountable? Who becomes responsible for those violations? You'd find that when you're talking about war crimes, you need not only to prove excessively as what we call the wrongful conduct, but you also need to satisfy the court that the person involved in mens rea a guilty mind in what you're accusing them of doing. Now, if I have activated a machine or an autonomous weapon system to kill person A, and then it goes and kill person B because it has got machine learning capabilities and end up making its own decision, it means I have no ministry, I have no guilt intention to kill person B. You cannot be able to convict me in a court of law. Who becomes accountable, responsible for that violation? Human rights, it's a certain point now to say the right to a remedy is a recognized right in the national human rights law. And the right to remedy also includes prosecution of the offender. So once you are making it impossible to prosecute the offender by using certain technologies, you are literally, in a way, taking away the right to a remedial aspect of accountability. Now, this issue of accountability gaps have been discussed intensively in the United Nations, in many other forums. But in this book, now I zero into the aspect of racial oppression, where I say we should discuss the issue of accountability gaps in context. Violation, when we're saying that there will not be someone to account for violation of rights, whose rights specifically? Here then I look at the context of many UN reports where it is made, made clear and also as a matter of fact that when it comes to use of force by state agents, say in law enforcement, usually it is people of color, people of certain minorities who are disproportionate. Now, so when you're talking of the accountability gap, which I've been just discussing, I'm trying now to contextualize it, to say in addition to the right of non-discrimination, which we're already backing, you'll be adding now another layer where after violation of, for example, right to life in a circumstance where a machine has been used, there is not even anybody to try and hold account. In the United States, I think you have noted whenever, for example, there is wrongful killing of a, of a citizen by a police officer. One of the things that many, people would be discussing is to say, prosecution of the uh, law, law enforcement uh, person, and if they are not guilty, then they, they are acquitted. If they are guilty, then they have to go to jail. For them. But imagine a situation now, you are using an autonomous weapon system. What becomes of the right to a remedy for the victim because you won't be able literally to uh, you know, convict, so to say, you can't send a machine to jail. It means it will be, yeah, the machine did it. And that will be the end of it. And it's a situation where we're saying, maybe we could call, we could change that. We could try to, to refocus on the aspect of human rights by maintaining what people are calling uh, the uh, meaningful human control. To so say, when it comes to use of force, let it remain a human to human affair. So that's the first one of the first recommendations we always give. The second one is we are saying in the upcoming treaty, which people are proposing, say we need a new international law governing autonomous local systems. Let's have a principle which I'm turning, I'm, I'm turning principle against discrimination and oppression. To say at every point, when we're developing these AI technologies, we should always question ourselves to what extent have we made sure that we have stopped uh, okay, the I, so yeah, that that's that's my, my apologies. So, oh, no, but give a recommendation. Give me one of your recommendations. So, that, that, that's the recommendation which I was actually now saying, <laughs> the aspect where I say in, in, in coming up with new treaties, 
uh, especially on autonomous local systems. It is essential, number one, for uh, to make sure there is there is no discrimination that is associated with these technologies, and for NGOs or other uh, civil societies who are working in this aspect to have, for example, uh, funding that looks into the issue of uh, racial discrimination that may be associated with this technology. I would want to end. end, end okay, but but the other you didn't do justice to your own chapter. Yeah. What he's also saying though is there's no, if I may, yeah, true. Sure. There's no sort of multilateral institution or infrastructure to address these issues. It falls between the gaps mm. in the existing sort of human rights and multilateral bodies for oversight. Yeah. I and mean, Thompson is being a little bit humble, I think, here. And you know, he's trying to work on this issue. And get, he gets sent from office to office, like, oh, no, that you belong in what yeah. the other offices yeah. are. Yeah. Yeah. So it, 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 it is, again, an example of a new challenge for which, in some cases, in this case, multilateral institutions are quite not fit for purpose and require some updating and, and uh, attention. Yeah, uh, just one sentence on what he's, he's referring to when he's saying multilateral uh, uh, aspects is that the UN Convention on Conventional Weapons is the forum within which these issues are being currently discussed. But its limitation is that that forum is only limited to aspects of uh, international material law, that is, um, uh, issues of armed conflict. You cannot raise it, it's rightfully say, uh, to say, let's discuss the racial implications of these of these technologies and uh, you know right. and how they may back certain communities. Someone will tell you this is not the correct forum within which we can be able to discuss that. Right. So that in itself, you, you are left with a, a, a group of individuals who know who will be affected this way. Here is, the, here is what scientists are saying regarding discrimination and bias associated with this kind of technology. But still now, where you can actually be able to articulate those issues becomes, you know, no way. Perfect. Very nice. Um, let's go to Angelita, um, who is remote. I can't see her because it's not a... I'm, I'm behind you, Chris. <laughs> I don't know. I, no, no, I want to see her behind you. <laughs> I see myself very big. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> oh, thank no. you so much. I hope, can you hear me well? Yes, yes, yes perfectly. Thank Great. You. Okay. Now, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you, Chris, for, first of all, for leading this wonderful initiative. It's been really, really fun and challenging to, to think uh, and, and propose specific recommendations on, on well, the topic that uh, Santiago Canton and I um, were asked to write about, which is the Inter-American Human Rights System. And you know, my co-author was for a long time the Executive Secretary of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. I also worked for many years there. And so we tried to, to use that experience of, of being from in, in the inside for a while, but also continue working uh, and revolving around the Inter-American System and 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 you know I, I continue to now litigate before the system. I bring cases. I advocate before the system. So, using all that that uh, experience and, and that view to to analyze where we are, what the challenges are, and make recommendations on this uh, on the regional human rights system, which has been really key in in the Western Hemisphere in different points in time throughout you know, its uh, more than now six decades of existence and. Um, so we mainly focus on the Inter-American Commission, which is often referred to as a grand jewel of the Organization of American States, which is the organization that houses uh, the, the regional human rights system. Um, and again, the commission in particular has been instrumental for uh, protecting and restoring democracy in certain countries. We can you know, think about Argentina under the dictatorship, Peru, under Fujimori, just to give a few examples. And uh, it has also been a key institution to advance and develop human rights standards in, in the hemisphere, including on uh, freedom of expression, uh, political rights, the rights of indigenous people to their ancestral lands, the rights of women and LGBTQ plus people to be free from violence, just you know, among many other issues. But as we try to point out in the in the chapter that we wrote this crown jewel needs polishing and the organization that houses it the organization of american states uh, also needs to step up and take a greater more proactive role in enforcing the decisions and the standards uh, for human rights protection that these both the inter-american commission and and the other main body of the human rights system which is the inter-american court of human rights have adopted throughout the years. 
And so in the chapter, we analyze some of the longstanding challenges that the, the system and in particular the Inter-American Commission have faced, including backlog in their individual petition system, which has been you know, very key to protect specific uh, the rights of specific people, but also developing standards that are applicable for, for broader populations. Uh, the lack of universal ratification of the regional human rights instruments. And of course, you know, the US stands out as one of the countries that has the, is, is one, is a default of uh, ratifying the basic inter-American treaties, but it's not the only one. Um, and we also analyze some of the emerging challenges. Uh, maybe they're not that recent, but they've become more obvious in, in, in the last decade or so, including the role of the commission in, in really helping address the threats and the challenges, uh, the human rights challenges that are posed by private actors in, in the region, including you know, the business sector, but also addressing climate change and the pervasive corruption that, that affects many countries in, in the Americas. And, and the impact that has in turn in the enjoyment uh, of, of basic human rights. So, um, it, you know, we, we see all these also in under the lens of, uh, of an increasingly difficult context, political context in the region, where populist governments, both on the right and the left, have found um, a common ground in their interest in weakening the human rights system at the regional level and have you know, a coincidence of, of terms and, and reinstating the, the right of, and like the, you know, of, of being sovereign states and, and accusing the commission in particular of, of meddling in internal affairs when the commission speaks out and, and, and points out some of the, the, the human rights um, challenges that, that states face. And so, many states and increasingly so are using the same threat that was not only that was not only a threat but actually materialized of Venezuela leaving the human rights system leaving the OES and then you know followed by Nicaragua uh, but we have a few more that are threatening to do the same and like you know more recently El Salvador I wouldn't be surprised that Guatemala also I mean it's it's it has hinted uh, to, to use that also um, as a threat. And what we see as well is the commission and the court to a lesser extent, but the Inter-American Commission really bending under that pressure. The commission currently is less vocal, is, is uh, less critical, is being more differential to states, and we can understand why you know, its own survival is at stake. At the end of the day, it's a system that uh, depends on the will of member states of the OES, but um, it's really affecting a lot of its credibility and, and effectiveness. And so, um, and it also we have an organization, the Organization of American States that is not really doing what it should or, or investing in what, works best in, in the organization, which is really its human rights um, bodies, the commission and the court. So we make um, a series of recommendations to the commission itself on, on, on uh, measures that could help address some of the historic challenges, but also some of the emerging challenges, and, um, and including expanding and maybe like replicating to some extent the model of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights of, of the UN in having more uh, constant presence in the different countries in the region, maybe even by establishing sub, sub regional hubs, because the commission is based in Washington DC and it's still very inaccessible for the populations that need it most. It's very far away, it's very distant. And uh, that affects obviously a lot of its, its work and, and, and um, access by, by many people around the region. So the, the other uh, set of recommendations, and this is just an example of the recommendations that we make, but we also make recommendations to the OES. And the, the first one I would say, or the most basic one is to really focus on human rights and democracy, which uh, is what seems to have a greater impact the, the OAS as an organization has now 
a wide array of mandates and, and priorities that are no longer priorities because it's really you know, spread very thin. It has lots of political and, and financial challenges. So our, our initial point is, you know, just focus on democracy and human rights and create, this is, you know, the, the one very specific uh, ask is to create uh, sort of a, like a high commissioner, an OAS high commissioner for human rights that can be play that role of helping states to comply with the decisions and apply the recommendations of the Inter-American Commission and, and the Inter-American Court. So really strictly bound by the interpretation of the regional human rights treaties that both the commission and the court uh, have, and that should continue to be their, their role. Um, but having that figure that can, in a way, do the things that neither the commission or the court can, can do to preserve their autonomy and independence. So that's one of the, of the, the recommendations that we make. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a critical point. I, I think with everything that's going on in the region and that we can see a lot of coincidences also in, in, in other regions uh, as well. But the, the system is right now at stake. It's in crisis and it needs to do some fundamental changes to really survive. And so that's basically the, the premise of, of this chapter. Thank you. It's a reminder in the chapter and in your description, Angelita, this how um, inter international norms and systems to protect human rights, in much of the way you're saying, Alex, too, sort of rest on a very uh, fragile consensus around them. And when that starts to fray, uh, we sort of assumed in many cases these were stable and would be enduring simply because they had a, their own momentum and they would tend to consolidate. And in fact, I think they're turning out to be much more fragile. Uh, than we realize, we, you know, once that starts, the foundation begins to to, to fray. It can it can really become collapse, and can force them to trim their sails quite a bit in terms of how they exercise their mandate. Of course, the Middle East doesn't have an inter American doesn't have a human rights system. But Asli is going to tell us about her chapter and uh, the analysis of human rights. Thank you. Yeah. So I was invited to talk about the or address in writing the in my chapter in the book um, the sort of current challenges to human rights in a region that doesn't have a regional system. So I should begin by saying thank you to the Harriman Institute for inviting us and having me on this panel. And thanks to Chris for pulling together this book and inviting contributions, even from those regions that don't have regional <laughs> systems. Uh, it was, and it was great to be in conversation actually with many of the authors. There were a series of workshops that proceeded on Zoom, um, the writing of our chapters, and I learned a great deal from the whole process. So thank you all around. Uh, so, uh, of course, the Middle East is a region in which there has been very limited penetration of international human rights norms, and so to the extent that we're talking about the weakening of commitments, it was a fragile system in the extreme to begin with. Uh, but that system has been deeply destabilized to the extent that it was present over the last two decades, primarily as a consequence of the post-9-11 interventions that the region um, was subjected to. Uh, and so my chapter really looks at geopolitical challenges um, in, from a different light in a sense than the ones that we've heard about so far today. It's not the rise of Russia or the rise of China, but it's the conduct of the West, the so-called core supporters and backers of the international human rights legal system as we know it for the last three quarters of a century that are responsible for the deterioration of the, both on the ground human rights circumstances in the region, but also the sort of appreciation of human rights as a normative framework across the region, which poses its own sets of challenges and possibly opportunities. And so I'll just paint the landscape, um, which some in the audience online and here might be familiar with, um, but I think it's important to underscore the context of how we got to the place, the impasse that we're at in the region, and then think a little bit about what that tells us about geopolitical competition and the possibilities going forward. Um, so as I say, post 9-11, so you know, wars in both Iraq and Afghanistan have fundamentally been lost, but not without first shattering the societies where those interventions took place and also causing the interventions to metastasize across vast regions of the world. Um, the story that we heard about that we began this panel with in Xinjiang, for example, is an instance of an authoritarian regime reappropriating the language of counterterrorism against unwanted minorities in its uh, society in order to endorse repression. And then the countries that sign on to letters written by China are countries that have 
adopted that very same script, but that script was made available by the United States and was proliferated around the world through the Security Council with the leadership, not of China or Russia, but the United States authoring the resolutions that enabled this counterterrorism framework to be made available and at the disposal of authoritarians around the world, and most significantly for the purposes of my chapter in the Middle East. And so the language of counterterrorism, the framework of the war on terror fully displaced human rights actively, even at the multilateral level at the United Nations for many years, there was simply no way that any of the human rights apparatus could resist the logics coming out of the Security Council around counterterrorism. Belatedly, we have a special rapporteur that looks at the human rights implications of counterterrorism and predictably has concluded that this has been an absolute decimation globally of the normative framework, which has been shredded under the pressure brought to bear on it by the West. And again, not at all by the rise of other competitors, but at the heart of the normative framework. And this has been true even prior to 9-11 in the Middle East, where the double standards to which Alex refer uh, referred in his comments have been sadly um, on display basically from the... Uh, from the birth of the human rights system, but have been especially put in relief as the post 9-11 um, reckoning that the region went through came to unravel the core authoritarian social contract that um, reflected governance across the region, you had the rise within a decade of the Arab uprisings. So the Arab uprisings really were the moment at which the repressive capacity of the state to continue to command quiescence in exchange for a certain degree of economic stability came to a complete end, uh, unraveled, and that social contract gave way to a popular uprising from the bottom up, demanding things in the language of human rights. So one could argue that it's the first truly human rights revolution um, that has been experienced globally, in which you had across an entire region, transnationally, public spontaneously rise up and make demands that they themselves framed in the language of human rights, albeit not through the Western lens. So not a language of human rights, primarily in terms of civil and political rights, but rather in terms of economic and social rights and the language of dignity. Dignity against forms of humiliating police apparatus, dignity against the systematic violations of right to life and right to bodily integrity, but then also breadth as a demand, as a fundamental demand and socioeconomic redressing of grotesque socioeconomic inequality. So you had a human rights revolution and the response from the sort of Western authors of the human rights system was, again, predictably that of double standards, backing of regimes that were long-term partners over and against these bottom-up demands from popular uprisings, whether in Egypt or in Tunisia in the case of France or Egypt in the case of the United States, or the cynical manipulation of these demands in, in order to topple adversaries in places like, for example, Syria, where suddenly the protesters were met with enormous amounts of support, both from the West and from West reliable Western allies uh, in the Gulf. So against this backdrop of the sort of um, stark relief in which these double standards were set by the Arab uprisings, you had the uprisings themselves give way to sort of three pathways. One, civil wars, and these were primarily in countries where the uprisings occurred against adversaries of the Western order in the Middle East, where again, as I say, there was an enormous amount of material support provided to those that were rising up, who were rising up with very legitimate grievances, but when you're trying to topple Qaddafi or Assad, you get a different kind of Western support and support from the Gulf than you might get if you're trying to topple Mubarak um, or, or uh, another actor. So Syria, Libya, and Yemen find themselves on a path of civil war. Elsewhere, you had counter-revolution directly funded by the Gulf, but supported by the West, particularly in places like, for example, Egypt, but also places that make the headlines less with respect to the Arab uprisings, like Jordan, Morocco, and elsewhere, where the repressive machinery was doubled down on, and you had counter-revolution under, uh, underwritten. And then you had places that were destabilized and are on a long-term trajectory of what I would call ongoing revolution. We see this today very clearly in Iran um, and from the Green Movement, which preceded the Arab uprisings, through the Giza protests in Turkey, which succeeded the Arab uprisings, you had the region as a whole, not just the Arab world, really convulsed by these um, phenomena. In Iran, we see them continuing, but not just in Iran, in Iraq, in Lebanon, in Algeria, in Sudan, we continue to see the echo through the decade. So these three trajectories of civil war, deep repression, and then ongoing uprising are the basic landscape that we now find uh, in the region. And what does that look like a decade after the uprisings or some more than a decade after the uprisings? Uh, the answer is war, drought, deprivation, severe inequality. In other words, humanitarian crises that have been directly exacerbated again by forms of Western intervention across the region in response to the aftermath of the 9-11 wars, and then the responses to the uprisings, which have also then produced the so-called global crisis of a significant outflow of, of migrants. 
So a migration crisis at Europe's doorstep, which then of course becomes a global agenda item, not because Lebanon has absorbed a million refugees in a country of three and a half million people, but because Europe was confronted with the possibility of a million refugees and a constant of 700 million people with the largest GDP in the world. In any case, uh, these humanitarian crises are further exacerbated by the realities of water scarcity and climate change, which are the kind of price that's being paid in the region by developments in the global north and practices in the global north that have, of course, global repercussions, but nowhere more severe than in a water scarce region um, like the Middle East. Layer on top of this, the surveillance tools that are the extension of the kinds of autonomous weapon systems that Thompson spoke to us about, the pandemic and the inadequacy of the health infrastructure of the region. And you see a region on the brink of absolute collapse, not just with respect to human rights, but across the board. The political bargains that have characterized the post-colonial period in the Middle East have given way to a period of simply chaos at this time in the region for the most part. And the question is, what is the relevance of the human rights framework in this context? Um, question that my chapter tries to address in the few minutes I have left. As I, for the reasons I've suggested, the human rights normative framework is tainted with the brush of imperialism and double standards across the region. So the language of human rights itself has come to be bankrupted in a way that means that while the vernacular of the protest were to call for human rights, it was not by reference to international frameworks, not by reference to the kind of lip service paid from the West. And in fact, the models of managerial authoritarianism that involve economic stability as with China remain more desirable, even to protesters that are using the vernacular of rights than the alternative being posed by the West. And this is a crisis in itself because it's a crisis of normative identity for a multilateral system that is no longer able to make a persuasive case that either stability or prosperity lie down the path of Western norms. And so that's one way to think about the challenge that's been posed. Another way is to think this is a time to reinvest in the economic, social, and cultural rights infrastructure that exists, but that has been deprived of resources in the multilateral system from the outset because the demands that are being articulated for clean environment, for adequate water, for sustainable development, for addressing the Gini coefficient, for dealing with the deep forms of social inequality that characterize the region are actually urgent crises globally. They're transnational crises that do demand attention and need attention through the language of human rights. But the language of human rights has been impoverished because of the failure to attend economic, social, and cultural rights. And so in a way, the region is a bellwether for a much needed pivot, in my view, in the global and multilateral approach to human rights. And then finally, and this, this is where my recommendations come in, um, there is a need for reparative justice. There was a lot of talk in the last couple of decades about responsibility to protect coming in and saving uh, civilian populations in the name of their humanitarian uh, welfare. And that indeed is, for example, the form of intervention that left Libya in tatters and on the brink of partition and in an ongoing civil war for the last 10 years. What we need instead is a responsibility to rebuild. There is a fundamental moral and human rights obligation by those states that are responsible for the catastrophic results and shattered societies that have been left in the wake of their wars to come in and actually face the consequences of their own actions, even though they may be thousands of miles away and, and think in reparative terms. And I think there is a human rights framework, the very one that Thompson spoke to, of remedial action. There is an actual requirement that when you cause harm, when you violate human rights, when you damage or shatter societies and their civilian infrastructure, that and you speak in the language of humanitarian welfare, there are reparative obligations that flow from that. So thinking about what that means, what would it look like to have a responsibility to rebuild, is I think an urgent human rights question that the Middle East poses perhaps more starkly, especially if we include Afghanistan, right? It's one thing to say, uh, there's been a catastrophic withdrawal, that's true. But I've painted a picture where I hope I've made a case that intervention itself has been catastrophic. So it's not the absence of intervention or the departure that's the problem. In many ways, geopolitical competition, geopolitical fragmentation, and a Western pivot away from the Middle East is perhaps the best news of the last three decades for the region. <laughs> but having said that, it's not just non-intervention, it's actually reparative obligations that go forward. That's what's failed in Afghanistan. There's been not only a total failure to offer any form of reparation, but there's been the freezing of the assets of the regime, making it impossible, however problematic. And I, of course, in no way am I intending this set of comments to legitimate the current regime in Afghanistan, but it has the responsibility and the right to provide for the humanitarian welfare of its own population, which means at least accessing its sovereign resources. The fact that its resources have been frozen, it cannot out access them and no reparation has been made is in a way a microcosm of the broader story of the global south which is a um you know two-thirds of the world that suffered colonization and then experienced decolonization with no reparation and was left then with a kind of 
um, material and moral um, legacies of long-term uh, expropriation uh, and extermination without any form of justice for those uh, those harms that were suffered. So ultimately, I think the MENA story and the geopolitical picture for the region and human rights is one in which we have to put back onto the agenda, not only the question of economic and social rights at large, but the kinds of reparative obligations that are owed to this region as a consequence of the ravages that intervention has brought. Amazing. Let's go straight to questions. I can talk about the conclusions but, and the recommendations, but we've already done that. Please. Uh, introduce yourself. Yeah, my name is Justin Burke. I am uh, the editor of EurasianNet, which is a daily news website that covers Eurasia. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, thank you, panelists. It's a very interesting uh, presentation. You talked about uh, the fragile consensus and then uh, also the Iran-Afghanistan factor in catalyzing the, what you might call, deterioration of norms. Is Ukraine or there potentially a catalyst for the revival of consensus and rethinking of uh, rights frameworks. Let's, do you want to go in reverse order? Sure. That's, um, you're not all exhausted. You, you've had a chapter brief. Right? No, no, I'm not okay. exhausted. Uh, okay. So I think one thing that's notable about the crisis in Ukraine is the response of the global South as a general matter has been sort of from the perspective at least of the United States, counterintuitively not to sign on to the condemnations of Russia, notwithstanding the fact that this represents uh, you know, an intervention that's a violation of sovereignty and that reflects many of the kinds of core anxieties that countries of the global South often express. And I think one reason for that is again, goes back to the kinds of points that I've just made. We have geopolitical fragmentation. It's not clear that countries are, to, to begin with, persuaded by the normative, the normative desirability of a international order that is premised exclusively on US hegemony or on Western domination as a general matter. So there's some degree of um, split loyalties, if you want. And uh, you know, China may command at least as much sort of um, cohesion pull, if you like, and compliance pull in the system today as the United States does. So part of it is that set of realignments. And part of it is the perception of double standards. And so again, like when there is a context in which you call for a war crimes tribunal or the crime of aggression to be tried in the case of Russia, but you have complete silence on the question of the Iraq war or any number of other interventions for which there has been no accountability, those kinds of memories run deep in parts of the global south that exceed the Middle East. So here I'm talking not only about the Middle East, but you know, um, Africa, certainly large swaths of South Asia, where these questions are raised explicitly in multilateral fora. So I think it's a moment where you have enormous um, consensus in the West. And so the core players of the original international human rights system have certainly coalesced again around the importance of the norm, the importance of multilateral institutions. You see the United States reinvesting in a form of multilateralism, but it has far less um, sort of uh, magnetism, if you want, or it's far less persuasive to other countries. And I think that speaks to the kind of geopolitical fragmentation we're in and suggests that it's not gonna be so easy, again, for reasons Alex pointed to, and I'll, uh, I'm sure he has his own thoughts on this question. You can't just exit the Human Rights Council, come back in, snap your fingers, and then command moral authority. So I think the United States has given um, away that mantle of legitimacy in some ways, ha is having difficulty reclaiming it, and that is having real implications for the multilateral normative system. I'm just going to add I'm going to exercise, you can abuse my role as a chair here and just say uh, one story that I heard from a Brazilian diplomat was asked, why, why didn't you vote? Um, yeah. in the, in the, and the Brazilian diplomat said, look, you, you, you can't come the day before the vote. Ask us, do you want to sign on to this Western resolution? You don't call the one. Why, why the, the approach, the, the, it was not nuanced. It was not sufficiently inclusive. And it really, it, it got their backs up legitimately, given the history of a number of Latin American governments who simply weren't going to, maybe they wouldn't have voted anyway. But it, it was very poorly handled. Yeah. Thompson, did you want to add something in this? Um, not, not, necessarily, not necessarily, but if I were just to maybe give an example, when if I, I, you ask whether this brings back maybe the need of uh, multilateralism on you know, aspect of things that are important in terms of global security. Just yesterday in the UNCCW, uh, uh, the, the, the UK, uh, supported with many European countries, they actually read their, their statement to the UNCCW discussing little autonomous processes by comparing how what's happening in Ukraine 
the Ukraine Russia war, uh, the disregard of international norms, how it always leads to catastrophic. So they were trying to use Ukraine Russia uh, situation to, to point to some of the important aspects that need to be done in terms of global issues that actually are better. So I would say to some extent, perhaps it brings it brings some some some, you know, for states who especially from the Western world, we have been taking a step back to say, well, each state can stand by itself and do what it wants. Ukraine Russia war is kind of at least in the Western side, bringing that idea to say perhaps working together and respecting the national norms is important. But of course, it comes to the aspects to say with many countries from the global south, they still that thing to say it only matters when it affects certain individuals or, or certain certain people, not necessarily that one anymore. Fair enough. Good, good note of optimism. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think I would um, generally agree with all the previous comments on that. I'll, I'll just add a, a couple of uh, additional thoughts. One is, I think it's precisely because of the Western unity that it appears that the global South is not on board, right? And I think probably the Russians thought they were going to get double the support of what they got. Like they would have gotten Crimea level support. They didn't get that. They didn't get 65 abstentions. They got 35. Right. Having said that, the abstentions that they got constitute half of humanity. Right. So it's a little bit of how, how do you count it? Right. Like China, India, Pakistan, South Africa, Bangladesh, right. Versus like Brazil versus number of countries. Right. The, the appeals have been multi vocal. Right. So it's not just one thing. It is about double standards. It is about hypocrisy. It is about where were you in Iraq? But it's also about like, we don't want sanctions. Like, why should we pay the price? I mean, like very material art, right? And that you see actually in the Pacific space. Then Georgia, as well as Kazakhstan, um, you know, in addition to um, uh, some of the places we talked about. So, uh, uh, so I think that's one. I think part of what um, has driven the Western response has been this um, outrage and stigmatization of Russia, right, on a level that we just haven't seen really since, I would say, almost like apartheid South Africa, right, in terms of this mass private sector pullout that you got within 48 hours in Russia, um, as well as you know, stigmatization on the cultural front, cancer culture, you know, barring for sporting federations and so forth. That, I think, sort of the global south looks at and it's like well <laughs> where was this mass kind of pull out with all these other causes so so for me i think in most cases it's not so much um a sympathy with russia it's just like what makes this so extraordinary compared to other interventions in conflicts i think it's it's more that that type of uh, uh that type of reaction and i actually think that the u.s and the west have erred in their messaging by pushing that this is primarily about defending the norm of democracy versus Putin's autocracy. It should be about defending sovereignty, yeah. right? And that's, you know, the most pressing kind of issue here. And that's the one I think that would find more kind of normative uh, resonance. But I think Bush at some point confused Iraq and Ukraine in a, in a public speech, public. and that yeah. really <laughs> sort of opened the door, I think, to some of the people. Yeah. I will say what was funny is that yeah. I live in London and, and the BBC uh, was covering the vote in the UNHRC, the UN Human Rights Council. I'm sure most BBC viewers are like, what the hell that? Yeah. Um, and I thought that was positive. Like for once, there was actually news coverage of the vote on Russia um, membership in the UNHRC. So I do think there's there, there are yeah. opportunities, much as yeah. Thompson was saying. Um, we'll see how that can, yeah. but I think it's been handled somewhat clumsily. But yeah, if I could just interject, uh, the BBC is viewed globally, right? And the fact that you never hear about the UNHRC until it's about Russia, but also <laughs> like yeah, the work part of the Ukraine refugee. I mean, yeah, yeah. for the whole of the global south, including Latin America, I mean, you know, people are being fast tracked at the Mexican border on the ground right. that they're Ukrainian, yeah. while Central Americans who have been waiting for, for years and years and have been told that they represent a public health crisis continue to be denied. In Europe, I mean, you know, Syrian, Afghan, Iraqi refugees are being allowed to freeze to death in the woods of Belarus, while the same countries are opening up, you know, their homes, everybody, I mean, anyway, the I could go on, but the yeah. bottom line yeah. is that right. these images are projected globally by channels like the BBC, and it's not lost on anybody, I think, in North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle yeah. East, Central Asia, South Asia, that some people are welcome. Some people's plight is seen as a genuine tragedy, and other people's plight is seen as a, a burden and a threat. Any other questions? We have anyone online? Yes, please. Did I buy something? 
My name is Eva. I'm a master's student at UCF Florida. So my question was, what role does one citizen citizenship play in determining human rights that are applicable to them? What if I want to? I missed the question. Of what role does one citizenship play in determining human rights that are applicable to them? I, I, I would say as a as a as a uh, uh, let's say the status of the law, it says to say that there should generally non discrimination. Your citizenship or your nationality should not determine the rights that accrue to all of us. Should accrue to us because we are human. But as a matter of reality, I think where examples have been given uh, many times, uh, your citizenship or your your nationality as a matter of political reality always sometimes play a role in whether, for example, your rights are respected or if they're not respected, whether you are afforded uh, you know, a remedy. So it shouldn't, as a matter of law, it actually should not uh, determine whether which kind of rights you you, 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 you get when you talk about, uh, especially the, the major, the major uh, human rights or fundamental human rights. But as a matter of political reality, unfortunately, it always plays differently. I know, I know you're probably still lurking behind me there. Um, did you want to weigh in on any of these? I kind of, I didn't mean to cut you out. No, thank you. I mean, on the citizenship role, the, the one, one thing is what ought to be, and another thing is what happens in reality. And obviously citizenship, unfortunately, does play a big role in, in the level of enjoyment of human rights. But from a more legal uh, point of view, there's actually a lot of very good uh, interpretation of the law that reaffirms almost every right is applicable without distinction, regardless of your citizenship status. Now, except maybe political rights. No? But there's a lot of very interesting case law um, around the world. But especially, I would say, in, I'm more familiar, obviously, with the inter-American system and, and from uh, you know, basic civil rights to the right to uh, equal access to health services and uh, to education, to even playing in, in uh, like being a journalist, a notary, a lawyer, uh, all that does not or should not uh, have anything to do, like depend at all on, on the citizenship. But, but in practice, it, you know, Obviously, that's that's another another thing, and that's why also the right to to citizenship, um, which is one that has been also extensively developed and and uh, analyzed under case law in the in in, in the Americas, is uh, one where you know a lot of rights really depend on that the recognition of of citizenship and nationality. So, just my my two cents on that. I don't know if I I understood correctly the question, but. Uh, this is my attempt. Yeah, no, I think that was absolutely spot on. And I'm going to end on that note just to say one of the things that we call for in the book, um, in the recommendations, is a need to really begin to sort of redefine uh, human rights along the lines of economic, social, and cultural rights um, to make them more relevant to, to the global South, to begin to change that discourse so it's seen less as a vestige of U.S. imperialism or Western imperialism, but more as something that is bound up in concepts of citizenship bound up in, citizen, in concepts of a livable future uh, for uh, next generations. And, and it, clearly, you know, there, there's a number of other reforms institutionally that would have to go along with that. And Thompson and others have talked about. So thank you all for joining us. Um, the book is actually, it, you can buy it online. Um, I don't this is the only living copy, I think, right now. <laughs> um, the, um, and uh, it's also, though, the ebook is available for free on Chatham House website, uh, I recommend you read it before the movie comes out because the, the, this will be far better than the movie. I just don't know who's going to play me. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was great. Yeah. Cool. Are you with Jim Kellis? Yeah. 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 Oh, is that right? Yeah. 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 He's, he's the force of nature. Yeah. He, he absolutely is. And actually, we're having the interim in LA. I, I hope I mean, like, I organize that and then unfortunately, oh, okay. but I'll go back to the country. Oh, no. But yeah, there's a session. Session is worked. Well, it's like it's good, but it's.